When I met Dawn Anderson, I didn't know what to think. She'd booked a counseling session seemingly out of the blue, and I had no prior information about her. She just called into the office, booked a session with my assistant, and popped up. It was a pale November Thursday, and my final session for the day. A streetlight outside was in an awkward position, casting long shadows across my office. As I closed the blinds, Dawn shifted in her seat. I've sought help before, she admitted, but I always get the impression that no one really listens. Therapy is often misunderstood, I said. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It is just maintenance, like taking a shower or doing your dishes. I haven't done my dishes in weeks, she laughed. A darkness fell over her face, and she hit herself upside the head repeatedly. Her curly brown hair swayed with each smack. No, she said, I have done my dishes. It's fine. I was exaggerating. I'm not lying. No worries, I said, sitting down across from her. Let's just have a chat and get to know each other. That sounds good, she nodded, calming down. Thank you. Dawn was born in 93 as the only child of Morgan and Lita Anderson of Comscog, Minnesota. Dawn seemed a bit distant when talking about her childhood, as if repeating something she'd rehearsed. They were very strict and distant. Sometimes they didn't seem like parents at all, she said. They had their moments, but there was no warmth. She would go on to tell stories about how they beat her if they thought she was telling a lie. They once withheld food for three days because she didn't tell them what she'd done at school that day. Withholding information, they argued, was a form of lying. They did do nice things at times. They'd often take her swimming down at Frog Lake and they always made sure her room had plenty of flowers and toys. It was strange, though, she admitted. Going swimming was almost a chore, twice a week, rain or shine. When it was too cold to go swimming, they'd give her a mud bath, where she was thoroughly scrubbed. It became routine, right down to rubbing my gums with it. It was almost as if Dawn brushed it aside. To her, childhood and parenting wasn't important. She seemed more urgently distressed, and as she recounted her past, she would often stop to make sure she was remembering it right. Apparently, it was very important for her to be as accurate as possible, a remnant from her strict upbringing. But I'm not here to talk about what used to be. She said, I'm here to talk about here and now. All right, I nodded. Let's talk about it. Who are you today? I'm a liar. She sighed. I've started telling lies. I waited for her to add something to it, but that was it. That was her big reveal. I leaned back in my chair, clutching my notebook. Does it happen often? I asked. Not really, she shrugged, every now and then, but it really bothers me. People tell little lies all the time, Dawn. That doesn't make them bad people. They don't tell them like I do. We locked eyes, and I could tell she was sincere. This was something that truly bothered her. For her... This was like admitting murder. My lies are different from others, she continued. They, I don't know how to explain it. They change things. Most lies do, I said. They change our perception. They manipulate. Yes, but they only manipulate people, she complained. Lies don't change what really happens. What do you mean, Dawn? She shifted uncomfortably in her chair. She took a deep breath and touched a curly strand of her brown hair for comfort. 
Meeting my eyes, she spoke in a low tone of voice. The streetlight outside broke the moment you closed the blinds. I looked back at the window. Strange how I hadn't noticed it. That awkward light would shine right into my patient's eyes. But it had gone dark. Very observant, I said. I didn't even notice. That's because I lie, she said. It just seems true, but it isn't. That light worked fine up until I said it didn't. So you turned it off, I asked, with your lies. Yes. She was dead serious. I got up from my chair and peeked out the window, just as she said. The light was completely broken. It was strange how I hadn't noticed it earlier. But sometimes you can get caught up in a routine that you don't take notice of the obvious. As I sat back down, she looked defeated. That's the thing, she sighed. It's really hard to convince people that I'm telling the truth that things change based on my lies. How would that work exactly? I asked. I don't know, Doan said, but... I didn't have an appointment when I came here today. I lied about it, and then suddenly I had one. That's not right, I smiled. We had a call in last Tuesday. We got your number and everything. I held up my cell phone, showing her the booking receipt. There it is. I change things, Dawn insisted. What I say changes things. It changes what happened to accommodate for my lies. So when did this start, Dawn? I think it has always been like this, she said. I think my parents knew. Maybe that's why they taught me to never lie. But you started lying anyway, I said. Can you remember something recent? There have been a few incidents, Dawn said. I used to have a friend who went to veterinary school and an acquaintance who worked for a bank. We'd been out of touch for years, and when we met, I got them mixed up. I was so convinced that the person who I had talked to had gone to veterinary school, but they didn't. No, they worked at a bank, I'm sure of it, but now they had both gone to veterinary school. They couldn't have. Memory is a fragile thing, I said. What is most likely? That you misremembered something or that your misunderstanding changed events that have already happened. I know what you want me to answer, but the proof is overwhelming. So why did you come here today, Dawn? I want to stop lying. I never want to lie again. She breathed a sigh of relief. I nodded, making notes in my notebook. What is stopping you? I asked. What stops you from being completely honest? Honestly, it is addicting, she said. Once you start, it's hard to stop. How so? I don't think you understand. The possibilities are staggering. It's like... If you could win the lottery by snapping your fingers, what would stop you from just snapping your fingers all day? Getting a sore thumb, I suppose. That's what it feels like to me, she said. It's like having a sore thumb in my mind. Every lie I tell is just... It takes something away. Life is full of little inconveniences, I said. I don't think you should punish yourself for finding ways to cope. It is not just coping, and it is not just punishing myself. It happens. Like using a muscle too much, it aches, it hurts. Is that why you hit yourself on the side of your head when we started talking? Yeah, she nodded. It distracts from the pain inside. Well, some of the things you're describing or impossible, Dawn. You can't change the past. I can see why you would like to, given the way you were raised, but it just can't be done. 
I'm going to stop you right there, Dawn said, holding up her hand. Tell me something you did this morning. All right, I, uh, I put on fresh white socks. Then why don't you have any socks on? As soon as I said it, I felt like an idiot. I stepped in a water puddle as I got to work and didn't have a spare pair with me. My wet socks were still hanging on the bathroom radiator. You didn't let me finish, I smiled. I do have them, just not on me right now. No, see? It changes. It changes and you just, just adapt to it. She knocked herself on the side of her head, clenching her eyes shut. Sparkles of sweat ran down her forehead. Dawn, look at it from my point of view. What is more likely, that you saw I wasn't wearing socks and used that information, or that you changed the very, very fabric of events? I know how it sounds, but that's what happens. And as long as it's just small things, all I get is a crackle in the back of my head. But as soon as I start telling big lies, it feels like I'm being ripped apart. With big lies, do you mean something we can't ignore? Do you have any examples? The first lie I ever told, she nodded. I had this dream of sunflowers when I was a kid. A whole field of them, all swaying in the wind. When I got to school, I drew them on a piece of paper. The yellow crayon was taken, so instead I colored them blue. That sounds lovely. It was until I got home. Our entire backyard was this large field of blue sunflowers. My parents, of course, acted like it had always been there. But it hadn't. No, my, my mom had a garden there. She grew tomatoes. We still had some in the fridge, but she insisted they were store-bought. So they never found out you were lying? Not at first, but I felt so bad that I admitted it. That's when I didn't get to eat for three days. They said it was because I hadn't told them about the drawing soon enough. Well, I think you will find it difficult to convince me that this is true, Dawn. But that is irrelevant. It is true to you, and that is what's most important. If you want to stop lying, there are ways to do so. But I'd like to get to the root of the problem and see where this is coming from. It bothers me that you don't believe me. I'm sorry to hear that, Dawn. But what you're describing is simply impossible. It bothers me greatly. We looked at one another. Dawn wasn't budging, but neither was I. How come you've pretended to write all this time when your pen has run out of ink? It's just to put the patient at ease, I smiled. Like a doctor with a stethoscope, it's expected, but not always practical. The last 40 pages you've written is just the text, Listen to Dawn, over and over. Well, of course it is, I chuckled. That's how I practice my cursing. And you don't see anything odd about this? Nothing at all? Coincidences happen, but all that you point out are things that I can clearly remember. I can't be surprised by a stated fact. But that's just... Uh. Dawn wiped her nose as a single drop of blood dripped out. I offered her a napkin, but she refused. This was clearly affecting her. I've talked to eight other people about this, she said. No matter what, they kept denying me. No matter what absurd proof I presented, all they do is rationalize it and call me schizophrenic. I don't think you are, Dawn. I think you have trauma to... It's not trauma! Dawn stood up, pacing back and forth. She was getting agitated. I stood up next to her, carefully putting my hand on her shoulder. Can I get you anything? Coffee? Tea? You're married, right? She asked. Do you love your wife? 
Of course, with all my heart. Do you, though? Do you really, really love her? Undoubtedly. Dawn shook her head. Can you feel right now the happiness she brings to your life? Yes, but what, then why are you considering divorcing her? It was like the twist of a knife in my chest. It was such an alien thought, but of course, I had been considering it for a long time. I couldn't think of a reason at the top of my head, and the way it made me feel was just awful. Patricia and I had our ups and downs over the years, but we'd always grow stronger because of it. Sure, we'd hit a rough patch in the past few weeks, but you said you loved her, Dawn said. You said you were happily married. Then something changed. Not changed as much as I scratched my head. I felt strange, like something had flipped my world upside down. Two drops of blood pushed themselves out of Dawn's eyes, just little red tears. You have to believe me, she said. Please believe me. I'm trying to, but fine. Let's go, growled Dawn. Let's go. She put on her jacket and pushed me down in my chair. She was getting aggressive, and I considered calling for security. Then, as soon as I sat down, she sat down across from me. She took a hold of my hand and didn't let go. Remember last night when you stabbed your wife? She asked. How in the hell did she know? My mouth opened wide like a trout as my mind started racing. There had been no one else there. It had been an accident, a fluke. We had talked about our thoughts of divorce, but it was nothing serious. Then it just escalated. You buried her in the backyard. Your hands still smell like dirt. What do you think about that? She continued. No, no, you can't. I could feel my body shutting down. Some sort of shock factor coursing through my brain. My hands started shaking. My eyes started tearing. I remembered it all so vividly. Patricia's soft hands covered by dirt, shovel after shovel. The way I scrubbed my hands but couldn't get rid of the smell. I still had dirt under my fingernails. It had happened, but I tried to push it away, to pretend like nothing, an alibi. Why would you do that? You loved her, didn't you? I did. I loved Patricia with every bone of my being. And yet, you kept her head in a plastic wrap in the back of your freezer. Of course, I couldn't let her go. I broke down. I cried like a baby. There was no way Dawn could have known this. I had barely even admitted to myself. There were thousands of little reasons leading up to what I had done, but to have it all splayed out like this in front of me, it was too much. My world was crumbling. My peace of mind had already rested on a knife's edge ready to tip me over to the side, but now I felt like I was free-falling. A pale hand feeling the worms outside. A bathroom still smelling of chlorine and bleach. A perfectly good hacksaw that I couldn't bear to look at ever again. Green eyes staring at me through thin plastic, asking me why. I threw myself out of the chair, enraged. She couldn't know. Dawn was suddenly bleeding out of her mouth, eyes, and nose. Still, she smiled. Every time, she laughed, why does no one ever listen? You've said enough. Really? Dawn pushed me away, breaking the leg of the table between us. As I landed on my back, she held me down with a hat rack. You drowned your daughter in a well. You ran over your mother-in-law with a car. You've killed three hitchhikers using the loaded rifle in the trunk of your car. 
I just screamed as the memories came flooding back to me. It was true, all of it. How in the hell did she know? It had been years. I covered my tracks so well. I got a hold of her foot and dragged her down to the floor next to me. I could barely see her in between the tears in my eyes. But I had to do something. I had to stop the pain. I had to end her. I tried to get my hands around her neck, but she resisted. She was stronger than I. Then again, she coughed as one of my hands touched her neck. All I've said today has been a lie, hasn't it? My mind went completely blank. As my eyes lost focus, I saw Dawn getting up. Her eyes were completely red, swollen with blood. She kept beating the side of her head with the palm of her hand, coughing all the while. I'd probably given her a bruise. It was, but it takes a while to rationalize the bigger stuff, she said. Give it some time. I, I don't, I didn't do any of that. I didn't. Of course not. All I said was a lie. But what? How? I think that's enough, sighed Dawn. I can't say I'm surprised. No one ever believes me. Just try to remember me as Dawn Anderson, a young human woman, and not the way you've truly seen me. As she left the office, I was still sitting on the floor. I couldn't even understand why. I had no reason to be upset or attack her. Sure, she'd been provoking me with mental images of harm coming to my family, but to attack her like that? It was insanity. Stress-induced hysteria or something. I sat alone in my office, feeling the pale light of the street light outside warm the back of my neck. I don't know what to believe, and I don't know if I will eventually rationalize all of this to some insane degree, but I know that it shook me to my core. There was something about Dawn that I had never seen in another patient, and to some degree, I believe she knows something impossible. And when I went home to open my freezer that night, I was genuinely scared to see something looking back at me, even though Patricia was sleeping soundly in the other room. But the shock of hearing what Dawn had said and the images it conjured in my mind, it remained. The untouched spot in my backyard, the hacksaw in the garage, it was still there, unused. I held Patricia tight that night, as I dreamt of murder, and if it really happened, if only for a while.